In this video, I'm gonna show you how this magical little device right here helped me find the ideal diet for my body and six things it taught me about how to eat healthier. If you're like me, you've tried a lot of different diets over time and it's really hard to know what diet is ideal for you besides just looking at the numbers on the scale. That all changed for me a few months ago though when I was able to start getting clear data on how my body responded to different foods. And today I'm gonna show you how that tracking works and a few of the things I've learned along the way. Now, before we get to the actual health takeaways, what is this thing anyway? One of the most important things to track for your health is your blood sugar. And when you go in for an annual physical, they might tell you not to eat in advance so they can do a fasting blood sugar test. Now, historically, if you wanted to know what your blood sugar was, you would have to prick your finger, draw blood, and then put it on a test strip and plug it into a little device. And that's what diabetics have been doing for years to monitor their blood sugar levels. But this is a relatively new device called a continuous glucose monitor, and this one's uh, called the Freestyle Libre. It's made by uh, Abbott Technologies. And what this does is you can just open it up and you can apply it to yourself, it kind of smacks on with a little applicator, and then you can start getting your actual blood sugar data on your phone. There's a little needle in there that is constantly sampling my blood and it doesn't feel like anything. I don't notice once it's on, but it gets a continuous read of my blood sugar and then is able to report that to my phone whenever I pull it out, open up the app, hit the glucose button and then tap on my arm. And you can actually see this is my glucose right now. It can also rate how well my body responds to different foods. So all of that data gets pulled into the Levels app and then you can record when you eat different things and it can give you a rating on what you ate. For example, this morning I had a streamer, which is kind of like an iced cappuccino. And you can actually see how my blood sugar responded to me drinking that. Now in that case, the score was good, right? I got a nine out of 10 because it didn't spike my blood sugar very much. But there are other things that might have more sugar that you might not process as well. And when you consume them, your blood sugar does spike. Here's an example. So that was a lightly sweetened drink I had yesterday. It only had about four grams of sugar, but as you can see, it still spiked my blood sugar quite a bit and it had a, you know, not so great impact on my health. But what does that mean, spike your blood sugar? Well, one way to measure how healthy or unhealthy a food is for you is how hard your body has to work to process it once it gets in your system. If eating something spikes your blood sugar, that means your pancreas has to release insulin to work to combat all the additional sugar that's going into your body. If you eat foods that spike your blood sugar too much or too often, you can end up overtaxing your pancreas, making it less effective at handling sugar over time. That can eventually lead to prediabetes or type 2 diabetes when you need supplemental insulin to handle any sugar that you're getting in your diet. Those spikes in blood sugar are also typically good indicators of what foods are going to encourage you to retain excess body fat, which most of us don't wanna do. Now, if you're diabetic, tracking your blood sugar is essential because it's how you figure out how much insulin you need to supplement for yourself. But even if you're not diabetic, it is an extremely useful uh, set of data to get on what you're eating to figure out whether foods are being handled well by your body or not and how you can adjust your diet accordingly. This is especially helpful since there's no perfect diet for everyone. And unless you get actual data on how your body is handling different foods, you won't totally know what's good for you and bad for you. So I've been doing this for at least four or five months now. And here are six things I've learned about health and diet that were kind of surprising to me. First up, ingredient quality matters. I was shocked at what a big difference using good ingredients makes in how much something affects your blood sugar. If I went to a restaurant and I ordered pasta, and I just got normal restaurant pasta, probably not made in house, uh, that would spike my blood sugar like crazy because it's a really carb heavy meal. And so I had assumed that pasta was just gonna do it no matter what. Turns out that's not true. When my wife and I made pasta from scratch using really high quality organic double zero flour, local farm fresh eggs to make it a little fattier, it had almost no impact at all. So just by shifting from less good restaurant or store-bought pasta to homemade really high quality ingredient pasta, I completely negated the blood sugar effect of that food and I get to enjoy pasta, <laughs> which is great. I saw the same thing with eating like typical bread that you might get at a sandwich place versus buying really fresh organic sourdough. The, the good sourdough had no impact at all my blood sugar, whereas a lot of the less good breads did. They would spike it up like crazy. So that was lesson number one is by choosing better ingredients, you can make many foods significantly uh, healthier for you. Lesson number two is that meal order and meal composition matters quite a bit for how much something spikes your blood sugar. Now this really surprised me because I discovered that I could actually change how much a food affected me by changing what else I ate it with and when I ate it. If I had a big bowl of rice with nothing else, that would spike my blood sugar like crazy because it's all carbs, right? 
But if I was having that rice with some avocado, some meat, maybe some other fat in there so that I was getting a good amount of fat and protein with it, there'd be very little impact. So simply by diversifying what I was eating a little bit, I got much less of a blood sugar impact for that meal. I also realized that ordering things throughout the day for how I ate them would affect how they affected my blood sugar. As a really simple example, one of my favorite coffee shops here in Austin, Levercraft, makes a drink called the Espresso Lemonade, which is basically a double shot of espresso with a little bit of lemon juice and a tiny bit of sweetener in it. If I had that on an empty stomach, it would spike me like crazy. But if I had some bone broth or a protein shake beforehand, there would be much lower impact and it would barely register at all in my CGM. If you're gonna have something sweet or if you wanna have a lot of carbs at a meal, balance it out with some protein or fat beforehand and you can significantly mitigate the impact of that food. Lesson number three was that eating late is really bad for sleep. Now, if you watched my video on the tools that I use for better sleep, one of the ones that I mentioned it there is the Aura Ring, which I use to track how well I'm sleeping, how well my body has recovered. Now, I was able to combine data from the Level CGM and my Aura Ring to see how foods were affecting my sleep. So for example, any kind of blood sugar spike before bed would both increase my resting heart rate, which is bad, and decrease my heart rate variability, which is also bad. And if you look at some of the graphs, you can really clearly see that when my blood sugar went back to normal, my HRV went back up, so I was recovering better. And when I didn't have some of those selects before bed, I was able to get into deeper sleep with a lower resting heart rate much faster than the nights where I went to bed with elevated blood sugar. So that's a really simple lesson, is if you wanna sleep better, don't eat close to bed, and especially don't eat things that are gonna spike your blood sugar. And that was really useful for me to see the data on. Lesson number four is that every body is different. Another really interesting part about doing this experiment is that my wife, Cosette, has been tracking her blood glucose as well. And one thing we've learned is that everybody's body responds differently to different foods. For example, she generally can tolerate carbohydrates better than I can, which I'm a little jealous of because there have been at least a couple times where we've, you know, been kind of bad. We'll both eat a ton of pizza and my blood glucose will go through the roof and hers will be largely unchanged. So you never totally know. And just because I'm saying some of these things are true, it's also worthwhile to test it for yourself and see, okay, what does my body respond to versus Nat's? You never totally know how your body's going to respond. And so actually, again, getting the data for yourself is really, really useful. Now lesson number five is that meal taste matters. And this has been pretty interesting to notice as well, but I could have the same meal a few times throughout a couple of weeks, maybe a Chipotle burrito bowl or something like that, and I was in a rush and scarfed it down really quickly. It would have a bigger impact on my blood sugar than if I ate it slower. So you might've heard the advice, oh, chew your meals more, slow down when you eat. It's actually good advice because if you slow down how quickly you hit your body with all of the carbs or whatever else is in your meal, it has more time to process it and it doesn't need to spike your blood sugar much. There are tangible positive impacts to just slowing down and trying to eat a little more mindfully. Lesson number six is that exercise seriously helps with digestion. And this is another one where, okay, it intuitively makes sense, but seeing the data was great. Where very simply, if I did just a short walk even after eating a meal, it would have a much lower impact on my blood sugar. You didn't need to do something crazy like go bang out a CrossFit workout or run a few 400 meter sprints. Simply taking a short walk around the block or a walk to the coffee shop would noticeably decrease how much my blood sugar elevated after eating a meal that had some carbs or something in it. Fairly common old knowledge, but it was really neat to see the data to back it up. I hope you enjoyed this video on how to use a continuous glucose monitor uh, to improve your health. If you want to get one for yourself, be sure you go to nataliason.com levels. And if you use that code, that'll help you skip some of the wait list because there can be a bit of a wait to get set up with one. And if you enjoy learning about how to use technology to improve your health, be sure to subscribe because I'm gonna be doing a bunch more videos like this. And if you haven't watched it yet and you enjoyed this video, you should definitely check out my one on my favorite tools for sleep, where I go deep into the nine different tools that I use to sleep much better and to help fight all of this noise and pollution and everything with better tech to make sure I get the best night of sleep possible. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.